board offline today we have the second part in our how to play tainted grail now this is going to cover combat and diplomacy the cool thing with combat and diplomacy is that they are very similar a lot of overlap in the rules for combat and diplomacy the first part of the video is going to be combat and then the second part is going to cover the parts of diplomacy that are different from combat so you got to watch the combat portion but then we won't be repeating stuff in the diplomacy version that you already know because you know how to play the combat so we're gonna get right down in there before we do get down to the game topper I want to mention our sponsor board game co this is a fantastic website where you can buy sell and trade games they have a great selection of games for you to choose from if you're looking to just build out your collection just buy more games you're just trying to you know you're all about getting more games into your collection right now go check them out they've got what you're looking for they also are very happy to take games off your hands We've got a great system, makes it easy for you to sell games. They'll give you a, you know, a, a price right there, easy to understand, easy to use the system. Go over there and check out how to sell games to them. But the really cool thing is the trade system. If you have a Board Game Geek account and you've set up a trade list, what you want in trade, what you have for trade, they, a Board Game Co. will look at your Board Game Geek account they'll look at that trade list they will compare it to their stock and they'll build a trade list right there on their website to facilitate a trade makes it very very easy if you don't have a board game geek account or you haven't built a trade list no big deal they still will trade with you of course it just takes a little bit more effort on your part to get that trade going so if you do go check out board game co be sure to click in the link in the description below so they know i sent you over there board game co makes it easy to buy sell and trade your way into a better collection okay without anything else we're gonna get down to the game topper and we're gonna sh show you how to play tainted grail combat in tainted grail is a turn-based confrontation between a character or party and an enemy enemies are represented by encounter cards characters will use their combat deck to build a sequence of cards with the aim of gaining enough markers in the combat pool to defeat the encounter. These markers represent the character's tactical advantage, wounds they've caused, and the opponent's exhaustion. A character may escape combat at any time during their activation. When they do, they lose one energy and trigger the opportunity attack listed here on the encounter card. Sometimes, as with the crazed farmhand, the opportunity attack will have no effect on the player. However, other times, as with this weird claimed, the opportunity attack will do some sort of negative effect to the character. If the escaping character is part of a party, the rest of the party remains in the encounter while the one escaping is removed. If all characters escape from combat, then the combat ends and the encounter is placed at the bottom of the encounter deck. Some enemies can also flee combat if they have run away as one of their attacks. When runaway triggers, the encounter immediately ends, and as usual, the encounter card is placed at the bottom of the deck. This also means that characters will receive no loot or reward. And for the purpose of any rules that reference winning combat, a enemy running away does not count as winning combat. Now let's take a closer look at exactly what the players will find on the combat encounter cards. This is the card's name. This indicates the encounter's level, in this case, level two. Encounters can be levels one, two, three, or four. This G indicates the encounter is a guardian, which is also indicated by this keyword. This is the encounter's resilience, which indicates the number of markers needed to be placed on the card in order for the encounter to be defeated. Flavor text is often found right here. Keywords and traits are found here. These are modifiers, which remain active throughout the encounter. This is the combat table and determines which attacks the enemy will perform based on the number of markers in the combat pool. So, if there were only two markers in the combat pool, the enemy would be performing the zero to four attack. As we've mentioned, this is the opportunity attack, which may be occasionally used. Any rewards or loot gained by the players is listed here. And these are the attribute keys listed on the side of the card, which we'll discuss in detail momentarily. 
Combat begins whenever the game asks the player to draw or pick a card from the gray, green, or purple encounter decks, and the drawn card has at least one open key on its right edge. After drawing the card, set it in the play area, making sure there's plenty of room to the right of it, because this is where the combat sequence will be built. Check to see what traits, if any, the card has. In this case, it has Rush. Some traits can take effect during this step. In the case of Rush, it indicates that the first character will receive two damage. Next, all party members make sure they're not using more than one item with each of the following keywords, weapon, shield, armor, companion, and relic. As you can see here, there are two weapons currently face up for our character. Make sure any inactive items are turned face down. And if the player decides simply not to use an active item, they should set it aside because once they've entered combat, they cannot change that decision. Once players have confirmed their equipment, each party member draws three cards from their combat deck. If playing a four player game, only two cards would be drawn. If the player does not like their starting hand, they may discard it and draw a new hand with one fewer cards. This may be repeated until the player draws a hand of only one card. Once all players have their starting hand, it's time to begin combat with phase one. But before we get into the phases of combat, let's take a look at exactly what players will find on the combat cards. The card's attribute keys are found here, though sometimes they may be found on the far right of the card as well. Each key is open and may connect to one bonus key on the next card in the sequence. Bonus keys face the opposite direction. Icons found in the attribute keys correspond to attributes on the character tray. As you can see here, Ignore Pain has an Aggression attribute keys here and Courage here. In order to use an attribute key, the player must have the indicated level for that attribute. In the case of both of these, level 2. As I mentioned before, bonus keys are found facing the opposite direction and may connect like this. This is the magic key. In order to use the magic key, the player must connect the left and right portion and spend one point of magic. This bottom key is the free key. This key always connects for free and provides the player with whatever the bonus is. This is the card's ability. The player may find multiple various timings with the card's abilities. Only visible abilities not covered by other cards are considered active. So currently this ability is active, but if I were to cover it like this, it would no longer be active and now this one would be. Passive combat cards always have their ability visible when in a sequence since their keys are split as you see here. As you can see, even with additional combat cards on either side of the passive ability, its ability is still visible. Some passive cards instruct the player to gain charges. Abilities that instruct the player to pay charges may be used at any time unless otherwise restricted. In this case, there is a restriction indicating that it may be used during the enemy's attack. When fighting in a party, only the active character may use charges. Additionally, if the active character is not the owner of the card, the owner must agree to this use as well. As you've seen, most combat cards have an ability. Abilities usually start with a trigger icon that clearly indicates when the player should resolve it. This icon indicates on placement. This ability should be resolved after placing the card into the sequence. This is the delayed icon. It indicates the player should put the number of time tokens on the card as indicated. The first thing players do during the start of the second phase of combat is remove one time token from each card that has one. When the final time token is removed from a card, its ability triggers. Time tokens are not replenished and the ability only triggers once. If another card is placed on a card with a time token, the time token is removed and that ability will not trigger. This icon indicates an ability that triggers when the enemy attacks. This slash icon here indicates the active player takes the amount of damage indicated. This icon indicates the player should count the number of connected keys of the indicated type throughout the entire sequence. Combat usually consists of several combat turns. Each combat turn consists of the following three phases. The first phase is pick the active character. The party members decide who will be the active character and any character that has not been activated may be selected. There is no set turn order during combat. 
If party members can't decide who should go first, then the character with the lowest character number becomes active. When playing with multiple characters, it can be helpful to place a time token on the player's character tile after using them. This way, players don't forget who has already gone. The second phase of combat is the character activation phase, and this is where the majority of combat will take place. Immediately upon entering the character activation phase, the players remove one time token from each combat card that has any. If this removes the final token from the card, immediately resolve its corresponding ability. In this case, the players will lose one of these and draw two of these. After resolving any triggered delayed abilities, the active character plays cards from their hand, adding them to the sequence. If the player fails to play even a single card, the enemy's opportunity attack will trigger. If the player is panicked, meaning that their terror is above their health, they will be forced to play at least one card. If a character is panicking, the first card they play in combat must be drawn directly from the top of their combat deck and played. This is mandatory and is a blind draw. Any cards played after that are selected from the player's hand as usual. When the player plays their first combat card of each activation, they don't need to connect it to any of their keys if they don't want to. However, once the card is played, the player does check to see if any attribute keys connect to bonus keys. Here you can see none do. If instead this card had been played, all three keys, two attribute keys and one free key, are connected. At this point, the players would apply each indicated bonus. After resolving the keys, then check the ability to see if it needs to be resolved. If it triggers, resolve it. As you can see, this one is an on-placement ability, and so it would trigger. Once the first card is fully resolved, the player may play additional cards if they wish. However, in order to do this, one of these golden lightning bolt symbols must connect. This is called a bonus action. After the player is either done playing cards or not playing any cards and instead receiving the opportunity attack, they perform a victory check. If there are a number of combat markers on the encounter equal to or higher than the card's resilience, then the players have defeated the encounter and have won. We'll discuss victory over an encounter in a little bit more detail shortly. However, if the player has not defeated the encounter, they will resolve the enemy attack. First, find the attack on the encounter that matches the current number of markers in the combat pool. There's currently zero markers in the combat pool, so the zero to two attack is the one that will be used. In this case, the active character receives one damage. Certain enemies will have an ability that allows them to remove markers from the combat pool, as you see here. There are also enemies who may be able to remove markers from the combat pool even when there are none in the combat pool, or when there are simply not enough to cover the loss. In that case, the active player must discard cards to cover the excess. After the enemy's attack and any combat pool modifications are made, perform another victory check. After that, players will need to check readiness, meaning check to see if any other party members have not been activated during this round of combat. If all characters have been activated, move on to phase three, end turn. If some characters have not yet been activated, move back to the pick active character phase. During the end turn phase, the first thing players must do is discard down to three cards in their hand. Next, all party members draw one card from their decks. If the player's character is currently panicking, they do not draw new combat cards. If the combat deck is empty, the player is forced to immediately escape from combat. They apply the standard combat escape rules. If players are using time tokens to keep track of which characters have been used, at this point they remove these time tokens from their character trays. Keep in mind this is entirely separate from time tokens used in the actual combat itself. And finally, a new turn of combat is begun, starting back at Phase 1. So now let's take a moment to discuss the various combat bonuses a player may gain through connecting their keys. This symbol indicates the player should add the number of combat markers indicated to the combat pool. In this case, 1, as long as a player has level 1 practicality, and 2 more for the free key down here. 
This symbol, as you might have guessed, is one of the most important in the game since it allows players to play additional combat cards during step two of their activation. This bonus has no effect if it was the first card played. Also, if this bonus is ever attached to a multiplier, there is no additional effect. This bonus indicates the player should draw a card. This icon indicates the player should discard the last card of their sequence. Frequently, this icon will target the card it's actually on. This icon, as you probably have guessed, multiplies the bonus next to it. So in this case, the player would actually draw two cards instead of one. And this icon indicates that the bonus next to it is void. Anytime the character's health drops to zero, the character gets a You Are Dying card. It's important to note that there is a You Are Dying card when using only a single character in a solo game, and there is a You Are Dying card co-op for use with multiple characters. The rules on the You Are Dying card are fairly self-explanatory and take effect immediately. Anytime the player is instructed to discard cards but does not have enough cards in their hand to fulfill that instruction, the excess cards must be discarded from the top of the combat deck instead. Players will run into quite a few different enemy traits in the game. All of them are explained on this reference card in pretty good detail. Just a few quick points to help you out. Anytime this card refers to a first character, it's referring to the very first character to act in this particular combat. For defensive, it says each first combat card of the activation adds one less combat marker to the combat pool. Remember that an activation is each individual character's turn. So in this case, every character, as soon as they go, that very first card will lose one combat marker. A good strategy here might be to play cards that are not going to add combat markers at all as your first card during your activation. The blue encounter cards in Tainted Grail are diplomacy encounters. Diplomacy is handled similarly to combat, and so many of the rules I will simply gloss over as I've already covered them during the combat section of this video. However, there are some key differences that we're going to cover in detail. The core mechanisms are the same as players will build a long line of cards to the right of the encounter. However, this time the players are trying to push this marker up the track to the top of it. This track is called the affinity track. Some diplomatic cards, as you see here, have only a single row. Others have two or more. If a diplomatic encounter has more than one row and those rows are numbered in numerical order like this, one and two, then this will require the player to work their way through multiple rows, completing each one. If instead the two rows have the same number here, one and one, then the players must choose one row to attempt. Once they've chosen it, they cannot change their mind. Characters may escape from diplomatic encounters just like they can combat, but this time they instead apply the failure text shown here. If the card has an avoid section as you see here, the player may decide to bypass the encounter entirely and in that case they have to pay all associated costs. They also must meet any prerequisites. In this case, they must have four reputation and then pay one energy. It's also important to keep in mind that the player may only avoid an encounter before they begin it. If in a party and checking reputation or attribute levels for the purposes of avoiding an encounter, the players only need to check the highest level. Also, they do not add the levels up. If there is a cost to avoid the fight, as you see here with the pay one energy, each party member suffers that penalty. To avoid an encounter, all party members must agree unanimously. If they cannot agree unanimously to avoid it, they will encounter it. Just as with combat encounters, no matter how the encounter is resolved, once it's over, place it at the bottom of its deck. Now let's take a closer look at exactly what players will find on the diplomacy encounters. As with combat, the name is here and the level is here. Any flavor text is found directly beneath the name. On the left side of the card is the affinity track. As we've already mentioned, the avoid cost is found here. Attribute keys are on the right, just as with combat. The stages of the encounter are found here. 
And this is the diplomacy table, which determines the response of the opponent. The cost of failing is found here, and the reward and or loot is found here. The setup for a diplomatic encounter is the same as a combat encounter, including items and the player's initial draw of cards. Once all players have their starting hand of cards, place a marker on the gray space of the affinity track. Now diplomacy begins. Diplomacy cards are very similar to combat cards. Bonus, attribute, magic, and free keys can all be found in the same places, as can abilities. Passive diplomacy cards work in the same way as passive combat cards. Charges may be used just as with combat cards. Phase 1 and 2 of diplomacy are resolved exactly the same way as combat. However, instead of a victory check, players will perform an affinity check after playing their cards. To perform an affinity check, simply check to see if the marker is on the topmost or bottommost slot of the affinity track. We'll discuss what happens in those cases momentarily. However, if the marker is not at the top or bottom of the track, then continue to the next step, the enemy response. While this diplomacy symbol indicates effects the player may have while playing cards, this symbol indicates what the opponent may do. During the opponent's response, find the current stage of the encounter and apply its effect to the active character. Let's say the players had opted for ask for shelter. The opponent's response is to push this down two spaces. After resolving the opponent's response, perform another affinity check. In this case, the players would now lose because this marker is at the very bottom of the track. But let's assume for a moment the players did not lose. In that case, the next step is to check readiness, which is resolved just as with combat. So let's talk about this affinity check in more detail. If this marker is at the very bottom, as we've said, the players lose. If the marker is at the very top and the players are playing a single stage encounter, then they win. However, if it is a multi-stage encounter, as you see here, the player moves the marker back to the gray slot, places a marker on the completed stage, skips the opponent's response, and goes straight to the check readiness step. End turn is resolved just as it is with combat. Diplomatic encounters use many of the same symbols as combat encounters. However, there are two additional bonuses players need to be aware of. Arrows pointing either up or down indicate that the marker will move the number of spaces shown. In this case, one space up. This affinity symbol is linked with the one here and shows what's going to happen based on the attribute linked. If players are on stage one, join the crowd. Every empathy and spirituality attribute they link will push the affinity marker up another space. Finally, the rules for panic, no cards in the deck, you are dying, and discarding from an empty hand are the same for diplomacy as they are for combat. When a player wins combat or diplomacy, each party member receives the full amount of anything listed as a reward. So in this case of winning this diplomacy, each party member would gain one magic and one reputation. However, the party will have to split anything listed as loot. So in this case, the party would have to decide who gets the one magic. Then the encounter card is placed at the bottom of its deck. Finally, the players reshuffle their entire combat deck or diplomacy deck, whichever one they were using. All right, there you go. That's Tainted Grail. Be sure to check out the first part of this series if you didn't watch that. That covers everything other than combat and diplomacy. Be sure to check out my other channel, Video Game Relapse, where we're covering all kinds of modern video games. I've been out of video games for seven years. Just jumped back in with an Xbox Series S. Got a lot of cool stuff happening over there. We got daily videos over there. Thursdays and Sundays, we have VGR plays, and then every other day is a raw footage of some game that I'm playing. Lots of cool stuff. And until next time, if you're bored online, bored offline.